The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, An Introduction, by Michel Foucault. Part 5. Right of Death and Power over Life For a long time, one of the characteristic privileges of sovereign power was the right to decide life and death. In a formal sense, it derived no doubt from the ancient patria potestas that granted the father of the Roman family the right to dispose of the life of his children and his slaves, just as he had given them life so he could take it away. By the time the right of life and death was framed by the classical theoreticians, it was in a considerably diminished form. It was no longer considered that this power of the sovereign over his subjects could be exercised in an absolute and unconditional way, but only in cases where the sovereign's very existence was in jeopardy, a sort of right of rejoinder. If he were threatened by external enemies who sought to overthrow him or contest his rights, he could then legitimately wage war and require his subjects to take part in the defence of the state. Without directly proposing their death, he was empowered to expose their life. In this sense, he wielded an indirect power over them of life and death. But if someone dared to rise up against him and transgress his laws, then he could exercise a direct power over the offender's life. As punishment, the latter would be put to death. Viewed in this way, the power of life and death was not an absolute privilege. It was conditioned by the defence of the sovereign and his own survival. Must we follow Hobbes in seeing it as the transfer to the prince of the natural right possessed by every individual to defend his life, even if this meant the death of others? Or should it be regarded as a specific right that was manifested with the formation of that new juridical being, the sovereign? In any case, in its modern form, relative and limited, as in its ancient and absolute form, the right of life and death is a dissymmetrical one. The sovereign exercised his right of life only by exercising his right to kill, or by refraining from killing. He evidenced his power over life only through the death he was capable of requiring. The right which was formulated as the power of life and death was in reality the right to take life or let live. Its symbol, after all, was the sword. Perhaps this juridical form must be referred to a historical type of society in which power was exercised mainly as a means of deduction, prélèvement, a subtraction mechanism, a right to appropriate a portion of the wealth, a tax of products, goods and services, labour and blood levied on the subjects. Power in this instance was essentially a right of seizure, of things, time, bodies and ultimately life itself. It culminated in the privilege to seize hold of life in order to suppress it. Since the classical age, the West has undergone a very profound transformation of these mechanisms of power. Deduction has tended to be no longer the major form of power, but merely one element among others, working to incite, reinforce, control, monitor, optimize and organize the forces under it a power bent on generating forces, making them grow and ordering them, rather than one dedicated to impeding them, making them submit or destroying them. There has been a parallel shift in the right of death, or at least a tendency to align itself with the exigencies of a life-administering power and to define itself accordingly. This death that was based on the right of the sovereign is now manifested as simply the reverse of the right of the social body to ensure, maintain, or develop its life. Yet wars were never as bloody as they have been since the 19th century, and all things being equal, never before did regimes visit such holocausts on their own populations. But this formidable power of death and this is perhaps what accounts for part of its force and the cynicism with which it has so greatly expanded its limits, now presents itself as the counterpart of a power that exerts a positive influence on life, that endeavours to administer, optimise and multiply it, subjecting it to precise controls and comprehensive regulations. Wars are no longer waged in the name of a sovereign who must be defended. They are waged on behalf of the existence of everyone, Entire populations are mobilized for the purpose of wholesale slaughter in the name of life necessity. Massacres have become vital. It is as managers of life and survival, of bodies and the race, that so many regimes have been able to wage so many wars, 
causing so many men to be killed. And through a turn that closes the circle, as the technology of wars has caused them to tend increasingly toward all-out destruction, the decision that initiates them and the one that terminates them are in fact increasingly informed by the naked question of survival. The atomic situation is now at the end point of this process. The power to expose a whole population to death is the underside of the power to guarantee an individual's continued existence. The principle underlying the tactics of battle, that one has to be capable of killing in order to go on living, has become the principle that defines the strategy of states. But the existence in question is no longer the juridical existence of sovereignty. At stake is the biological existence of a population. If genocide is indeed the dream of modern powers, this is not because of a recent return of the ancient right to kill. It is because power is situated and exercised at the level of life, the species, the race, and the large-scale phenomena of population. On another level, I might have taken up the example of the death penalty. Together with war, it was for a long time the other form of the right of the sword. It constituted the reply of the sovereign to those who attacked his will, his law, or his person. Those who died on the scaffold became fewer and fewer, in contrast to those who died in wars, but it was for the same reasons that the latter became more numerous and the former more and more rare. As soon as power gave itself the function of administering life, its reason for being and the logic of its exercise, and not the awakening of humanitarian feelings, made it more and more difficult to apply the death penalty. How could power exercise its highest prerogatives by putting people to death, when its main role was to ensure, sustain, and multiply life, to put this life in order? For such a power, execution was at the same time a limit, a scandal, and a contradiction. Hence, capital punishment could not be maintained except by invoking less the enormity of the crime itself than the monstrosity of the criminal, his incorrigibility, and the safeguard of society. One had the right to kill those who represented a kind of biological danger to others. One might say that the ancient right to take life or let live was replaced by a power to foster life or disallow it to the point of death. This is perhaps what explains that disqualification of death which marks the recent wane of the rituals that accompanied it. That death is so carefully evaded is linked less to a new anxiety which makes death unbearable for our societies than to the fact that the procedures of power have not ceased to turn away from death. In the passage from this world to the other, death was the manner in which a terrestrial sovereignty was relieved by another singularly more powerful sovereignty. The pageantry that surrounded it was in the category of political ceremony. Now it is over life, throughout its unfolding, that power establishes its dominion. Death is power's limit, the moment that escapes it. Death becomes the most secret aspect of existence, the most private. It is not surprising that suicide, once a crime, since it was a way to usurp the power of death which the sovereign alone, whether the one here below or the lord above, had the right to exercise, became, in the course of the nineteenth century, one of the first conducts to enter into the sphere of sociological analysis. It testified to the individual and private right to die, at the borders and in the interstices of power that was exercised over life. This determination to die, strange and yet so persistent and constant in its manifestations, and consequently so difficult to explain as being due to particular circumstances or individual accidents, was one of the first astonishments of a society in which political power had assigned itself the task of administering life. In concrete terms, starting in the 17th century, this power over life evolved in two basic forms. These forms were not antithetical, however. They constituted rather two poles of development linked together by a whole intermediary cluster of relations. One of these poles, the first to be formed, it seems, centered on the body as a machine. Its disciplining, the optimization of its capabilities, the extortion of its forces, the parallel increase of its usefulness and its docility, its integration into systems of efficient and economic controls, all this was ensured by the procedures of power that characterized the disciplines, 
an anatomopolitics of the human body. The second, formed somewhat later, focused on the species body, the body imbued with the mechanics of life and serving as the basis of the biological processes, propagation, births and mortality, the level of health, life expectancy and longevity, with all the conditions that can cause these to vary. Their supervision was affected through an entire series of interventions and regulatory controls, a biopolitics of the population. The disciplines of the body and the regulations of the population constituted the two poles around which the organization of power over life was deployed. The setting up, in the course of the classical age, of this great bipolar technology, anatomic and biological, individualizing and specifying, directed toward the performances of the body, with attention to the processes of life, characterized a power whose highest function was perhaps no longer to kill, but to invest life through and through. The old power of death that symbolized sovereign power was now carefully supplanted by the administration of bodies and the calculated management of life. During the classical period, there was a rapid development of various disciplines, universities, secondary schools, barracks, workshops. There was also the emergence in the field of political practices and economic observation of the problems of birth rate, longevity, public health, housing and migration. Hence, there was an explosion of numerous and diverse techniques for achieving the subjugation of bodies and the control of populations, marking the beginning of an era of biopower. The two directions taken by its development still appeared to be clearly separate in the 18th century. With regard to discipline, this development was embodied in institutions such as the army and the schools, and in reflections on tactics, apprenticeship, education and the nature of societies, ranging from the strictly military analyses of Marshal de Saxe to the political reveries of Guibert or Servan. As for population controls, one notes the emergence of demography, the evaluation of the relationship between resources and inhabitants, the constructing of tables analyzing wealth and its circulation, the work of Conet, Moreau and Susmilch, the philosophy of the ideologists as a theory of ideas, signs and the individual genesis of sensations, but also a theory of the social composition of interests, ideology being a doctrine of apprenticeship, but also a doctrine of contracts and the regulated formation of the social body, no doubt constituted the abstract discourse in which one sought to coordinate these two techniques of power in order to construct a general theory of it. In point of fact, however, they were not to be joined at the level of a speculative discourse, but in the form of concrete arrangements, agencements concrets, that would go to make up the great technology of power in the 19th century. The deployment of sexuality would be one of them, and one of the most important. This biopower was without question an indispensable element in the development of capitalism. The latter would not have been possible without the controlled insertion of bodies into the machinery of production and the adjustment of the phenomena of population to economic processes. But this was not all it required. It also needed the growth of both these factors, their reinforcement as well as their availability and docility. It had to have methods of power capable of optimizing forces, aptitudes and life in general without at the same time making them more difficult to govern. If the development of the great instruments of the state as institutions of power ensured the maintenance of production relations, the rudiments of anatomo and biopolitics created in the 18th century as techniques of power present at every level of the social body and utilized by very diverse institutions the family and the army, schools and the police, individual medicine and the administration of collective bodies, operated in the sphere of economic processes, their development and the forces working to sustain them. They also acted as factors of segregation and social hierarchization, exerting their influence on the respective forces of both these movements, guaranteeing relations of domination and effects of hegemony. The adjustment of the accumulation of men to that of capital, the joining of the growth of human groups to the expansion of productive forces and the differential allocation of profit, were made possible in part by the exercise of biopower in its many forms and modes of application. The investment of the body, its valorization and the distributive management of its forces were at the time indispensable.
One knows how many times the question has been raised concerning the role of an ascetic morality in the first formation of capitalism, but what occurred in the 18th century in some Western countries, an event bound up with the development of capitalism, was a different phenomenon having perhaps a wider impact than the new morality. This was nothing less than the entry of life into history, that is, the entry of phenomena peculiar to the life of the human species into the order of knowledge and power, into the sphere of political techniques. It is not a question of claiming that this was the moment when the first contact between life and history was brought about. On the contrary, the pressure exerted by the biological on the historical had remained very strong for thousands of years, Epidemics and famine were the two great dramatic forms of this relationship that was always dominated by the menace of death. But through a circular process, the economic and primarily agricultural development of the 18th century and an increase in productivity and resources even more rapid than the demographic growth it encouraged allowed a measure of relief from these profound threats. Despite some renewed outbreaks, the period of great ravages from starvation and plague had come to a close before the French Revolution. Death was ceasing to torment life so directly. But at the same time, the development of the different fields of knowledge concerned with life in general, the improvement of agricultural techniques, and the observations and measures relative to man's life and survival contributed to this relaxation. A relative control over life averted some of the imminent risks of death. In the space for movement thus conquered, and broadening and organizing that space, methods of power and knowledge assumed responsibility for the life processes and undertook to control and modify them. Western man was gradually learning what it meant to be a living species in a living world, to have a body, conditions of existence, probabilities of life, an individual and collective welfare, forces that could be modified, and a space in which they could be distributed in an optimal manner. For the first time in history, no doubt, biological existence was reflected in political existence. The fact of living was no longer an inaccessible substrate that only emerged from time to time amid the randomness of death and its fatality. Part of it passed into knowledge's field of control and power's sphere of intervention. Power would no longer be dealing simply with legal subjects over whom the ultimate dominion was death, but with living beings, and the mastery it would be able to exercise over them would have to be applied at the level of life itself. It was the taking charge of life, more than the threat of death, that gave power its access even to the body. If one can apply the term biohistory to the pressures through which the movements of life and the processes of history interfere with one another, one would have to speak of biopower to designate what brought life and its mechanisms into the realm of explicit calculations and made knowledge power an agent of transformation of human life. It is not that life has been totally integrated into techniques that govern and administer it. It constantly escapes them. Outside the Western world, famine exists on a greater scale than ever and the biological risks confronting the species are perhaps greater and certainly more serious than before the birth of microbiology. But what might be called a society's threshold of modernity has been reached when the life of the species is wagered on its own political strategies. For millennia, man remained what he was for Aristotle, a living animal with the additional capacity for a political existence. Modern man is an animal whose politics places his existence as a living being in question. This transformation had considerable consequences. It would serve no purpose here to dwell on the rupture that occurred then in the pattern of scientific discourse and on the manner in which the twofold problematic of life and man disrupted and redistributed the order of the classical episteme. If the question of man was raised, in so far as he was a specific living being and specifically related to other living beings, the reason for this is to be sought in the new mode of relation between history and life. In this dual position of life that placed it at the same time outside history, in its biological environment, and inside human historicity, penetrated by the latter's techniques of knowledge and power. There is no need either to lay further stress on the proliferation of political technologies that ensued, 
investing the body, health, modes of subsistence and habitation, living conditions, the whole space of existence. Another consequence of this development of biopower was the growing importance assumed by the action of the norm at the expense of the juridical system of the law. Law cannot help but be armed, and its arm, par excellence, is death. To those who transgress it, it replies, at least as a last resort, with that absolute menace. The law always refers to the sword. But a power whose task is to take charge of life needs continuous regulatory and corrective mechanisms. It is no longer a matter of bringing death into play in the field of sovereignty, but of distributing the living in the domain of value and utility. Such a power has to qualify, measure, appraise, and hierarchize, rather than display itself in its murderous splendor. It does not have to draw the line that separates the enemies of the sovereign from his obedient subjects. It affects distributions around the norm. I do not mean to say that the law fades into the background, or that the institutions of justice tend to disappear, but rather that the law operates more and more as a norm, and that the judicial institution is increasingly incorporated into a continuum of apparatuses, medical, administrative, and so on, whose functions are for the most part regulatory. A normalizing society is the historical outcome of a technology of power centered on life. We have entered a phase of juridical regression in comparison with the pre-17th century societies we are acquainted with. We should not be deceived by all the constitutions framed throughout the world since the French Revolution, the codes written and revised, a whole continual and clamorous legislative activity. These were the forms that made an essentially normalizing power acceptable. Moreover, against this power that was still new in the 19th century, the forces that resisted relied for support on the very thing it invested, that is, on life and man as a living being. Since the last century, the great struggles that have challenged the general system of power were not guided by the belief in a return to former rights, or by the age-old dream of a cycle of time or a golden age. One no longer aspired toward the coming of the emperor of the poor, or the kingdom of the latter days, or even the restoration of our imagined ancestral rights. What was demanded, and what served as an objective, was life, understood as the basic needs, man's concrete essence, the realization of his potential, a plenitude of the possible. Whether or not it was utopia that was wanted is of little importance. What we have seen has been a very real process of struggle. Life as a political object was, in a sense, taken at face value and turned back against the system that was bent on controlling it. It was life more than the law that became the issue of political struggles, even if the latter were formulated through affirmations concerning rights. The right to life, to one's body, to health, to happiness, to the satisfaction of needs, and beyond all the oppressions or alienations, the right to rediscover what one is and all that one can be, this right, which the classical juridical system was utterly incapable of comprehending, was the political response to all these new procedures of power which did not derive either from the traditional right of sovereignty. This is the background that enables us to understand the importance assumed by sex as a political issue. It was at the pivot of the two axes along which developed the entire political technology of life. On the one hand, it was tied to the disciplines of the body, the harnessing, intensification, and distribution of forces, the adjustment and economy of energies. On the other hand, it was applied to the regulation of populations through all the far-reaching effects of its activity. It fitted in both categories at once, giving rise to infinitesimal surveillances, permanent controls, extremely meticulous orderings of space, indeterminate medical or psychological examinations, to an entire micro-power concerned with the body. But it gave rise as well to comprehensive measures, statistical assessments and interventions aimed at the entire social body or at groups taken as a whole. Sex was a means of access both to the life of the body and the life of the species. It was employed as a standard for the disciplines and a basis of regulations. 
This is why in the 19th century sexuality was sought out in the smallest details of individual existences. It was tracked down in behavior, pursued in dreams, it was suspected of underlying the least follies, it was traced back into the earliest years of childhood, it became the stamp of individuality. At the same time, what enabled one to analyze the latter and what made it possible to master it. But one also sees it becoming the theme of political operations, economic interventions, through incitements to or curbs on procreation, and ideological campaigns for raising standards of morality and responsibility. It was put forward as the index of a society's strength, revealing of both its political energy and its biological vigor. Spread out from one pole to the other of this technology of sex was a whole series of different tactics that combined in varying proportions the objective of disciplining the body and that of regulating populations. Whence the importance of the four great lines of attack along which the politics of sex advanced for two centuries. Each one was a way of combining disciplinary techniques with regulative methods. The first two rested on the requirements of regulation, on a whole thematic of the species, descent and collective welfare, in order to obtain results at the level of discipline. The sexualization of children was accomplished in the form of a campaign for the health of the race. Precocious sexuality was presented from the 18th century to the end of the 19th as an epidemic menace that risked compromising not only the future health of adults, but the future of the entire society and species. The historization of women, which involved a thorough medicalization of their bodies and their sex, was carried out in the name of the responsibility they owed to the health of their children, the solidity of the family institution, and the safeguarding of society. It was the reverse relationship that applied in the case of birth controls and the psychiatrization of perversions. Here the intervention was regulatory in nature, but it had to rely on the demand for individual disciplines and constraints, the dressage. Broadly speaking, at the juncture of the body and the population, sex became a crucial target of a power organized around the management of life rather than the menace of death. The blood relation long remained an important element in the mechanisms of power, its manifestations and its rituals. For a society in which the systems of alliance, the political form of the sovereign, the differentiation into orders and castes, and the value of descent lines were predominant, for a society in which famine, epidemics and violence made death imminent, blood constituted one of the fundamental values. It owed its high value at the same time to its instrumental role, the ability to shed blood, to the way it functioned in the order of signs, to have a certain blood, to be of the same blood, to be prepared to risk one's blood, and also to its precariousness, easily spilled, subject to drying up, too readily mixed, capable of being quickly corrupted. A society of blood, I was tempted to say of sanguinity, where power spoke through blood, the honor of war, the fear of famine, the triumph of death, the sovereign with his sword, executioners and tortures. Blood was a reality with a symbolic function. We, on the other hand, are in a society of sex, or rather a society with a sexuality. The mechanisms of power are addressed to the body, to life, to what causes it to proliferate, to what reinforces the species, its stamina, its ability to dominate, or its capacity for being used. Through the themes of health, progeny, race, the future of the species, the vitality of the social body, power spoke of sexuality and to sexuality. The latter was not a mark or a symbol, it was an object and a target. Moreover, its importance was due less to its rarity or its precariousness than to its insistence, its insidious presence, the fact that it was everywhere an object of excitement and fear at the same time. Power delineated it, aroused it, and employed it as the proliferating meaning that had always to be taken control of again, lest it escape. It was an effect with a meaning value. I do not mean to say that a substitution of sex for blood was by itself responsible for all the transformations that marked the threshold of our modernity. It is not the soul of two civilizations or the organizing principle of two cultural forms that I am attempting to express.
I am looking for the reasons for which sexuality, far from being repressed in the society of that period, on the contrary, was constantly aroused. The new procedures of power that were devised during the classical age and employed in the 19th century were what caused our societies to go from a symbolics of blood to an analytics of sexuality. Clearly, nothing was more on the side of the law, death, transgression, the symbolic, and sovereignty than blood. Just as sexuality was on the side of the norm, knowledge, life, meaning, the disciplines, and regulations. Saad and the first eugenists were contemporary with this transition from sanguinity to sexuality. But whereas the first dreams of the perfecting of the species inclined the whole problem toward an extremely exacting administration of sex, the art of determining good marriages, of inducing the desired fertilities, of ensuring the health and longevity of children, and while the new concept of race tended to obliterate the aristocratic particularities of blood, retaining only the controllable effects of sex, Saad carried the exhaustive analysis of sex over into the mechanisms of the old power of sovereignty, and endowed it with the ancient but fully maintained prestige of blood. The latter flowed through the whole dimensions of pleasure, the blood of torture and absolute power, the blood of the caste which was respected in itself and which nonetheless was made to flow in the major rituals of parricide and incest, the blood of the people, which was shed unreservedly since the salt that flowed in its veins was not even deserving of a name. In Saad, sex is without any norm or intrinsic rule that might be formulated from its own nature. But it is subject to the unrestricted law of a power which itself knows no other law but its own. If by chance it is at times forced to accept the order of progressions carefully disciplined into successive days, this exercise carries it to a point where it is no longer anything but a unique and naked sovereignty, an unlimited right of all-powerful monstrosity. While it is true that the analytics of sexuality and the symbolics of blood were grounded at first in two very distinct regimes of power, in actual fact the passage from one to the other did not come about, any more than did these powers themselves, without overlappings, interactions, and echoes. In different ways, the preoccupation with blood and the law has for nearly two centuries haunted the administration of sexuality. Two of these interferences are noteworthy, the one for its historical importance, the other for the problems it poses. Beginning in the second half of the 19th century, the thematics of blood was sometimes called on to lend its entire historical weight toward revitalizing the type of political power that was exercised through the devices of sexuality. Racism took shape at this point, racism in its modern biologizing statist form. It was then that a whole politics of settlement, peuplement, family, marriage, education, social hierarchization, and property accompanied by a long series of permanent interventions at the level of the body, conduct, health, and everyday life, received their color and their justification from the mythical concern with protecting the purity of the blood and ensuring the triumph of the race. Nazism was doubtless the most cunning and the most naive, and the former because of the latter, combination of the fantasies of blood and the paroxysms of a disciplinary power. A eugenic ordering of society, with all that implied in the way of extension and intensification of micro-powers, in the guise of an unrestricted state control, étatisation, was accompanied by the onaric exaltation of a superior blood. The latter implied both the systematic genocide of others and the risk of exposing oneself to a total sacrifice. It is an irony of history that the Hitlerite politics of sex remained an insignificant practice while the blood myth was transformed into the greatest bloodbath in recent memory. At the opposite extreme, starting from this same end of the 19th century, we can trace the theoretical effort to reinscribe the thematic of sexuality in the system of law, the symbolic order, and sovereignty. It is to the political credit of psychoanalysis or at least of what was most coherent in it, that it regarded with suspicion, and this from its inception, that is, from the moment it broke away from the neuropsychiatry of degenerescence, 
The irrevocably proliferating aspects which might be contained in these power mechanisms aimed at controlling and administering the everyday life of sexuality. Whence the Freudian endeavour, out of reaction no doubt to the great surge of racism that was contemporary with it, to ground sexuality in the law, the law of alliance, tabooed consanguinity, and the sovereign father, in short, to surround desire with all the trappings of the old order of power. It was owing to this that psychoanalysis was, in the main, with a few exceptions, in theoretical and practical opposition to fascism. But this position of psychoanalysis was tied to a specific historical conjuncture. And yet, to conceive the category of the sexual in terms of the law, death, blood, and sovereignty, whatever the references to Saad and Bataille, and however one might gauge their subversive influence, is in the last analysis a historical retroversion. We must conceptualize the deployment of sexuality on the basis of the techniques of power that are contemporary with it. People are going to say that I am dealing in a historicism which is more careless than radical, that I am evading the biologically established existence of sexual functions for the benefit of phenomena that are variable, perhaps, but fragile, secondary, and ultimately superficial, and that I speak of sexuality as if sex did not exist. And one would be entitled to object as follows. You claim to analyze in detail the processes by which women's bodies, the lives of children, family relationships, and an entire network of social relations were sexualized. You wish to describe that great awakening of sexual concern since the 18th century and our growing eagerness to suspect the presence of sex in everything. Let us admit as much and suppose that the mechanisms of power were in fact used more to arouse and excite sexuality than to repress it. But here you remain quite near to the thing you no doubt believe you have gotten away from. At bottom, when you point out phenomena of diffusion, anchorage and fixation of sexuality, you are trying to reveal what might be called the organization of erotic zones in the social body. It may well be the case that you have done nothing more than transpose to the level of diffuse processes mechanisms which psychoanalysis has identified with precision at the level of the individual. But you pass over the thing on the basis of which this sexualization was able to develop and which psychoanalysis does not fail to recognize, namely sex. Before Freud, one sought to localize sexuality as closely as possible. In sex, in its reproductive functions, in its immediate anatomical localizations, one fell back on a biological minimum, organ, instinct, and finality. You, on the other hand, are in a symmetrical and inverse position. For you, there remain only groundless effects, ramifications without roots, a sexuality without a sex. What is this if not castration once again? Here we need to distinguish between two questions. First, does the analysis of sexuality necessarily imply the elision of the body, anatomy, the biological, the functional? To this question, I think we can reply in the negative. In any case, the purpose of the present study is in fact to show how deployments of power are directly connected to the body, to bodies, functions, physiological processes, sensations and pleasures, Far from the body having to be effaced, what is needed is to make it visible through an analysis in which the biological and the historical are not consecutive to one another, as in the evolutionism of the first sociologists, but are bound together in an increasingly complex fashion in accordance with the development of the modern technologies of power that take life as their objective. Hence, I do not envisage a history of mentalities that would take account of bodies only through the manner in which they have been perceived and given meaning and value, but a history of bodies and the manner in which what is most material and most vital in them has been invested. Another question, distinct from the first one. This materiality that is referred to, is it not then that of sex? And is it not paradoxical to venture a history of sexuality at the level of bodies without there being the least question of sex? After all, is the power that is exercised through sexuality not directed specifically at that element of reality which is sex, sex in general?
that sexuality is not in relation to power an exterior domain to which power is applied, that on the contrary it is a result and an instrument of power's designs, is all very well. But as for sex, is it not the other with respect to power, while being the centre around which sexuality distributes its effects? Now it is precisely this idea of sex in itself that we cannot accept without examination. Is sex really the anchorage point that supports the manifestations of sexuality? Or is it not rather a complex idea that was formed inside the deployment of sexuality? In any case, one could show how this idea of sex took form in the different strategies of power and the definite role it played therein. All along the great lines which the development of the deployment of sexuality has followed since the 19th century, one sees the elaboration of this idea that there exists something other than bodies, organs, somatic localizations, functions, anatomophysiological systems, sensations, and pleasures. Something else and something more, with intrinsic properties and laws of its own. Sex. Thus, in the process of historization of women, sex was defined in three ways. As that which belongs in common to men and women, as that which belongs par excellence to men, and hence is lacking in women, but at the same time as that which by itself constitutes woman's body, ordering it wholly in terms of the functions of reproduction and keeping it in constant agitation through the effects of that very function. Hysteria was interpreted in this strategy as the movement of sex in so far as it was the one and the other, whole and part, principle and lack. In the sexualization of childhood, there was formed the idea of a sex that was both present from the evidence of anatomy and absent from the standpoint of physiology, present too if one considered its activity, and deficient if one referred to its reproductive finality, or again actual in its manifestations but hidden in its eventual effects, whose pathological seriousness would only become apparent later. If the sex of the child was still present in the adult, it was in the form of a secret causality that tended to nullify the sex of the latter. It was one of the tenets of 18th and 19th century medicine that precocious sex would eventually result in sterility, impotence, frigidity, the inability to experience pleasure, or the deadening of the senses. By sexualizing childhood, the idea was established of a sex characterized essentially by the interplay of presence and absence, the visible and the hidden. Masturbation and the effects imputed to it were thought to reveal in a privileged way this interplay of presence and absence, of the visible and the hidden. In the psychiatrization of perversions, sex was related to biological functions and to an anatomophysiological machinery that gave it its meaning that is, its finality. But it was also referred to an instinct which, through its peculiar development and according to the objects to which it could become attached, made it possible for perverse behavior patterns to arise and made their genesis intelligible. Thus, sex was defined by the interlacing of function and instinct, finality and signification. Moreover, this was the form in which it was manifested, more clearly than anywhere else, in the model perversion, in that fetishism, which, from at least as early as 1877, served as the guiding thread for analyzing all the other deviations. In it, one could clearly perceive the way in which the instinct became fastened to an object in accordance with an individual's historical adherence and biological inadequacy. Lastly, in the socialization of procreative behavior, sex was described as being caught between a law of reality economic necessity being its most abrupt and immediate form, and an economy of pleasure, which was always attempting to circumvent that law, when, that is, it did not ignore it altogether. The most notorious of frauds, coitus interruptus, represented the point where the insistence of the real forced an end to pleasure, and where the pleasure found a way to surface despite the economy dictated by the real. It is apparent that the deployment of sexuality, with its different strategies, was what established this notion of sex, and in the four major forms of hysteria, onanism, fetishism, and interrupted coition, it showed this sex to be governed by the interplay of whole and part, 
principle and lack, absence and presence, excess and deficiency, by the function of instinct, finality and meaning, of reality and pleasure. The theory thus generated performed a certain number of functions that made it indispensable. First, the notion of sex made it possible to group together, in an artificial unity, anatomical elements, biological functions, conducts, sensations and pleasures, and it enabled one to make use of this fictitious unity as a causal principle, an omnipresent meaning, a secret to be discovered everywhere. Sex was thus able to function as a unique signifier and as a universal signified. Further, by presenting itself in a unitary fashion, as anatomy and lack, as function and latency, as instinct and meaning, it was able to mark the line of contact between a knowledge of human sexuality and the biological sciences of reproduction. Thus, without really borrowing anything from these sciences, excepting a few doubtful analogies, the knowledge of sexuality gained through proximity a guarantee of quasi-scientificity. But by virtue of this same proximity, some of the contents of biology and physiology were able to serve as a principle of normality for human sexuality. Finally, the notion of sex brought about a fundamental reversal. It made it possible to invert the representation of the relationships of power to sexuality, causing the latter to appear not in its essential and positive relation to power, but as being rooted in a specific and irreducible urgency which power tries as best it can to dominate. Thus, the idea of sex makes it possible to evade what gives power its power. It enables one to conceive power solely as law and taboo. Sex, that agency which appears to dominate us and that secret which seems to underlie all that we are, that point which enthralls us through the power it manifests and the meaning it conceals, and which we ask to reveal what we are and to free us from what defines us, is doubtless but an ideal point made necessary by the deployment of sexuality and its operation. We must not make the mistake of thinking that sex is an autonomous agency which secondarily produces manifold effects of sexuality over the entire length of its surface of contact with power. On the contrary, sex is the most speculative, most ideal and most internal element in a deployment of sexuality organized by power in its grip on bodies and their materiality, their forces, energies, sensations and pleasures. It might be added that sex performs yet another function that runs through and sustains the ones we have just examined. Its role in this instance is more practical than theoretical. It is through sex, in fact an imaginary point determined by the deployment of sexuality, that each individual has to pass in order to have access to his own intelligibility, seeing that it is both the hidden aspect and the generative principle of meaning to the whole of his body, since it is a real and threatened part of it while symbolically constituting the whole, to his identity, since it joins the force of a drive to the singularity of a history. Through a reversal that doubtless had its surreptitious beginnings long ago, it was already making itself felt at the time of the Christian pastoral of the flesh, we have arrived at the point where we expect our intelligibility to come from what was for many centuries thought of as madness, the plenitude of our body from what was long considered its stigma and likened to a wound, our identity from what was perceived as an obscure and nameless urge. Hence the importance we ascribe to it, the reverential fear with which we surround it, the care we take to know it. Hence the fact that over the centuries it has become more important than our soul, more important almost than our life. And so it is that all the world's enigmas appear frivolous to us compared to this secret minuscule in each of us, but of a density that makes it more serious than any other. The Faustian pact, whose temptation has been instilled in us by the deployment of sexuality, is now as follows. To exchange life in its entirety for sex itself, for the truth and the sovereignty of sex. Sex is worth dying for. It is in this strictly historical sense that sex is indeed imbued with the death instinct. When a long while ago the West discovered love, it bestowed on it a value high enough to make death acceptable. 
Nowadays, it is sex that claims this equivalence, the highest of all. And while the deployment of sexuality permits the techniques of power to invest life, the fictitious point of sex, itself marked by that deployment, exerts enough charm on everyone for them to accept hearing the grumble of death within it. By creating the imaginary element that is sex, the deployment of sexuality established one of its most essential internal operating principles, the desire for sex, the desire to have it, to have access to it, to discover it, to liberate it, to articulate it in discourse, to formulate it in truth. It constituted sex itself as something desirable, and it is this desirability of sex that attaches each one of us to the injunction to know it, to reveal its law and its power. It is this desirability that makes us think we are affirming the rights of our sex against all power, when in fact we are fastened to the deployment of sexuality that has lifted up from deep within us a sort of mirage in which we think we see ourselves reflected, the dark shimmer of sex. It is sex, said Kate in the plumed serpent, how wonderful sex can be when men keep it powerful and sacred and it fills the world, like sunshine through and through one. So we must not refer a history of sexuality to the agency of sex, but rather show how sex is historically subordinate to sexuality. We must not place sex on the side of reality and sexuality on that of confused ideas and illusions. Sexuality is a very real historical formation. It is what gave rise to the notion of sex as a speculative element necessary to its operation. We must not think that by saying yes to sex, one says no to power. On the contrary, one tracks along the course laid out by the general deployment of sexuality. It is the agency of sex that we must break away from if we aim, through a tactical reversal of the various mechanisms of sexuality, to counter the grips of power with the claims of bodies, pleasures and knowledges in their multiplicity and their possibility of resistance. The rallying point for the counterattack against the deployment of sexuality ought not to be sex desire, but bodies and pleasures. There has been so much action in the past, said D. H. Lawrence, especially sexual action, a wearying repetition over and over, without a corresponding thought, a corresponding realization. Now our business is to realize sex. Today the full conscious realization of sex is even more important than the act itself. Perhaps one day people will wonder at this. They will not be able to understand how a civilization so intent on developing enormous instruments of production and destruction found the time and the infinite patience to inquire so anxiously concerning the actual state of sex. People will smile, perhaps, when they recall that here were men, meaning ourselves, who believed that therein resided a truth every bit as precious as the one they had already demanded from the earth, the stars, and the pure forms of their thought. People will be surprised at the eagerness with which we went about pretending to rouse from its slumber a sexuality which everything, our discourses, our customs, our institutions, our regulations, our knowledges, was busy producing in the light of day and broadcasting to noisy accompaniment. And people will ask themselves why we were so bent on ending the rule of silence regarding what was the noisiest of our preoccupations. In retrospect, this noise may appear to have been out of place, but how much stranger will seem our persistence in interpreting it as but the refusal to speak and the order to remain silent? People will wonder what could have made us so presumptuous. They will look for the reasons that might explain why we prided ourselves on being the first to grant sex the importance we say is its due, and how we came to congratulate ourselves for finally in the twentieth century, having broken free of a long period of harsh repression, a protracted Christian asceticism greedily and fastidiously adapted to the imperatives of bourgeois economy. And what we now perceive as the chronicle of a censorship and the difficult struggle to remove it will be seen rather as the centuries-long rise of a complex deployment for compelling sex to speak, for fastening our attention and concern upon sex,
for getting us to believe in the sovereignty of its law when in fact we were moved by the power mechanisms of sexuality. People will be amused at the reproach of pansexualism that was once aimed at Freud and psychoanalysis, but the ones who will appear to have been blind will perhaps be not so much those who formulated the objection as those who discounted it out of hand, as if it merely expressed the fears of an outmoded prudishness. For the first, after all, were only taken unawares by a process which had begun long before, and by which, unbeknown to them, they were already surrounded on all sides. What they had attributed solely to the genius of Freud had already gone through a long stage of preparation. They had gotten their dates wrong as to the establishment, in our society, of a general deployment of sexuality. But the others were mistaken concerning the nature of the process. They believed that Freud had at last, through a sudden reversal, restored to sex the rightful share which it had been denied for so long. They had not seen how the good genius of Freud had placed it at one of the critical points marked out for it since the 18th century by the strategies of knowledge and power, how wonderfully effective he was, worthy of the greatest spiritual fathers and directors of the classical period, in giving a new impetus to the secular injunction to study sex and transform it into discourse. We are often reminded of the countless procedures which Christianity once employed to make us detest the body. But let us ponder all the ruses that were employed for centuries to make us love sex, to make the knowledge of it desirable and everything said about it precious. Let us consider the stratagems by which we were induced to apply all our skills to discovering its secrets, by which we were attached to the obligation to draw out its truth and made guilty for having failed to recognize it for so long. These devices are what ought to make us wonder today. Moreover, we need to consider the possibility that one day, perhaps, in a different economy of bodies and pleasures, people will no longer quite understand how the ruses of sexuality and the power that sustains its organization were able to subject us to that austere monarchy of sex, so that we became dedicated to the endless task of forcing its secret, of exacting the truest of confessions from a shadow. The irony of this deployment is in having us believe that our liberation is in the balance.